The following podcast contains spoilers and words like piss, shit, and fuck. We watch it. Hello everybody and welcome back to We Watched a Thing! We made it through another year, it's the end of the year and so I'm very, very lucky to have this amazing guest on. I love him, you love him, it's Jason from Binge Movies. How you doing, mate? <laughs> With a welcome like that, I'm, I'm doing incredible, man. I just <laughs> made, that made my whole year, yeah. Well, as a card-carrying binge lord, it is you like... Are. It's great to have you on, man. Like, you are such a fun guy to chat movies with. And this is something I've never done before, which I think we'll we'll talk about. I've never done a worst of list before, but the idea came up, obviously, when you and I did Firestarter on the show. Oh, and I was like, yeah. well, any chance to have Jason on the show, we're doing it. So, <laughs> I mean, I know that uh, you were saying before you're guesting on the Countdown's best of list this year. Have you ever done a worst of list before? <laughs> I mean, probably, right? Probably, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, uh, let me, it's 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 bad podcast protocol to start on somebody else's show with a rant, and so no, uh, go for it, please. But I've got a bit of a whinge. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen a, a lot uh, from professional film critics um, uh, on film Twitter as it still exists as we recorded this. It's day by day <laughs> yeah. over there. It um, may not that, exist you know, tomorrow. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really shouldn't. You shouldn't do a worst of list because the movies are hard to make, and undoubtedly, movies are hard to make. And that, but here's the thing: those same film critics, all year long, yeah, post incredibly scathing, at times deeply personally offensive reviews, yeah. critiquing the economics critiquing the skill level critiquing the acting prowess critiquing the screenwriting abilities of countless people movies are hard <laughs> when they're critiquing them they don't get yeah. harder when they're already done at the end of the year yeah, yeah. and these are tomato meter approved <laughs> film critics yeah. so here's what i have to say if you have ever left a snarky comment about a single movie ever on Letterboxd or had it had it in a conversation or ever yeah. tweeted something, even a meme that was poking fun at a movie, and yes, that even includes Marvel movies, and yes, even Adam Sandler movies, <laughs> then you need to get off of your fucking self-righteous high horse Yeah, because you have made your top worst movies of the year list. You That's just right. didn't rank them. Yeah, because all you've got to do is sort their reviews by like star rating. Correct, you've got it right there. Yeah, <laughs> correct. So these these and I, I, you know, here's the thing: if somebody were to come to me and go, "Look, movies are hard; they're hard to make." I'm trying to tone myself down here for you, B Dizzle. <laughs> but if movies are hard, they're hard to make, and so therefore, if I watch a movie I don't like it, I just don't leave a star review, and I just clock it in my letterbox diary, and I don't really talk about it. And as like a as an individual film goer. That makes perfect sense. And I would say, okay, I get that you probably then wouldn't like doing a worst of list. But I'm specifically talking about professional film critics, podcasters, TikTokers, YouTubers, all of these people out here who I, I yeah. watch. This isn't hypothetical. I see it all year long. Them yep. post and write and record some of the most scathing things yep. I have ever seen about real movies that have real people who worked really hard on them for those same people at the end of the year to then turn around and go, don't be mean. Yeah. For, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And and here's the other thing. You can do a worst of the year list uh, without actually going anywhere near as critical or as scathing as those people's oh. ordinary reviews are. Absolutely, absolutely. All, all we're doing here today, B. Dizzle, because you're a man of positivity, is we're just summarizing of all the movies we've watched this year, which for me is somewhere in the range of just under 400 films um, that I've watched this year. Um, here are the ones that worked for me the absolute least. Yeah, and yeah. Here, some of them I'm going to be more incensed about than others because... <laughs> Because they are shoddily made or they're morally dubious in, in the case of at least one of the films I'm going to talk about. Um, but that's it. It's also just my opinion. It's not definitive. I'm not trying to take, take bread out of the mouths of people. I mean, for, for I'm going to get off this 
I'll just end it like this. <laughs> We're going to do this list and no one's going to be out of a job because of it. Well, yeah, absolutely. But the, yeah. but the critics who are going to be mad at us for making this list can leave a one star review. And the person who produced that movie or the person who was a, who, who was a, a mid-level person, that film may not get another job. If that review then tanks a tom- tomato meter score, tomato meter score. And a studio yeah. blames that for the lack of box office returns. These yeah. people are taking actual opportunities away from real living workers. We are not a worst of list is not going to do anything to, to in it hamper anybody's ability to earn a paycheck, but their reviews will. I love the rant. Love it. I agree with you 100%. And I think you're exactly right. You can do a worst of list without being scathing or mean or anything. Because or as dunking said, on from, people. Yeah, for most correct. critics, that's already been done throughout the year. And you're, I, I am kind of a positive person. I just love movies. So yes. for me, the way I've approached this list is more what movies disappointed me the most this year. Like maybe for a lot of them, they're movies that my hopes were really high for. And then I was just like really let down. So that's kind of more the way I've approached it. Billy, what's film criticism? What, what is criticism? If there's no critique, what are you telling me? You're telling me, well, that's really hard to do. So you shouldn't critique it. I mean, you're a film critic. You're getting paid (laughs) to critique things that are hard for people to do. Exactly. Ultimately critiquing is an assessment of the success of performance. Yeah. I mean, good food is hard to cook, but there's still food critics out there who say, well, this was terrible. <laughs> like, Correct. I mean, everything is hard to do, but we critique everything on a daily basis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just what I, people what, do. <laughs> and here's the thing. I, I, this started a brewing last year on film Twitter, but it's like, it just blew up. And I've just, it's just seen all of these people, including some people I know and I have respect for, but they're just like, Oh, you, you know, you can't do it. You can't do it. It's so tacky. It's so this, uh, and I'm like, I've seen your letterbox, the things you <laughs> say about people who are, who are also users on letterbox. They can read your review yeah. at variety. They can read your review on your, wherever, you know, wherever you're writing, they can hear your podcast. They can like, like, why is all of a sudden this w- make it a worst of list? Like it somehow codifies something yeah. that now all of a sudden it's off limits. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So we're going to do it. We're going to stick with it. We're going to do it. And if you've got a yes, problem with are. it, you can tweet me as long as Twitter exists at binge movies. <laughs> and I will not respond because I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Love it. Well, let's get straight into it then. Can yeah. you kick us off with your number five? Oh, buddy, <laughs> I was only supposed to give you five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I can give you five, but I've got ten, so maybe we could do some honorable mentions here. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, coming in number five for me is the three five five. This was a the all female sort of spy actioner where agents, the top female agents from America and the UK and China and Colombia and Germany. They all came together. This has an all-star cast of Jessica Chastain, Lupita Nyong'o, Penelope Cruz, Diane Kruger, Fan Bingbing, Sebastian Stan, Edgar Ramirez, and the list goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive cast. Massive cast. And on paper, this is the exact sort of movie that I would love. This is, this is um, you know, the, the international intrigue with great female actors who you don't typically see taking an action turn doing a lot of practical action in a sort of Jason Bourne esque world. This should have been a home run. This is one of the most convoluted and boring and pointless plots of the year. And I think this incredible cast and all the effort that went into it, speaking of hard work was completely let down by an inert script. This is just absolutely a, it is not a worthwhile time at the movies. And that's how can you possibly put all these people together and yeah. say, yeah. Uh, and also, by the way, the director is Simon Kinberg, who hasn't done a lot of great movies. Uh, <laughs> this is the guy who did the Dark Phoenix, for instance. And and I think he's maybe right. doing a Logan's Logan's Run remake of Holy some kind. Holy shit. I didn't know they were uh, doing Logan's Run. <laughs> uh, apparently, and I, I, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not encouraged about its chances if he's the one writing and directing it. <laughs> But even even besides that, this should have worked. This should have been better. Not only was this movie a flop, it was also just extraordinarily boring. And, and I, I can't understate this enough. Extremely 
unnecessarily convoluted. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, my number five, and I may cop some flack for this one. And let me preface this. I'm not one of those guys who just inherently hates Marvel movies. There's a lot of Marvel movies that I really quite enjoy. And that's actually the reason this one cracked my list. And I'm talking about Doctor Strange 2 Multiverse of Madness. Oh, wow. Because- I actually really enjoyed the first Doctor Strange. Me too. And yeah. it was a surprise. I went in, yeah. And I'm a big Sam Raimi fan. I love his horror films. I thought that this would have a really cool horror twist. You know, just the month before this, we saw everything everywhere all at once, which no spoilers, yeah. but that's going to make my top five of the year list. For sure. And that movie plays with the idea of the multiverse incredibly well. And it got me so hyped for this. And then I went in and I saw it. You get like two multiverses, which are very similar. It doesn't play with this concept at all in a fun way. I thought the direction was really flat. The storyline and script were just absolutely no good. Because I was also a big fan of WandaVision. And that got me pumped going into this. And I was so disappointed walking out of the cinema. I just had the worst time with this movie. And it felt like it never ended. It felt so long. (laughs) Well, this, this, I, I did, I like this movie. Um, I don't know that I, upon a revisit, I would like it. Do you think that this was hurt? Do you think this was hurt even more because we had such a fresh take that was kind of coming, you know, no one had even really heard of everything ever at all at once. All of a sudden it just appears, it becomes a festival darling, and then it opens in your town and it's, it's. It's, you know, it, it, do you think this that that hurt it even more? Usually, it's Abs- the other way around, where the big budget hurts the smaller budget. Yeah, but absolutely, that hurt it for me. I just think like the inventiveness of that film. Yeah. It, even yeah. you know, you look at Spider Verse only a yeah. couple of years yeah. ago, which That's again plays with that concept so well. And this movie, you know, it's it's Marvel's first kind of entry into this realm of multiverses. I mean, mm-hmm. granted, n- not long before I think we had No Way Home, which kind of obviously played with that concept. But this was our first time really seeing those different universes and it just was not fun at all. Yeah, I I think it's really hard because you're right. We saw so much we saw such uh fresh kinetic creativity with the con this exact same concept. Yes. And then yep. you saw the studio version of it and it lacked all of that creativity and it really shouldn't have because you are you have Sam Raimi, who is a, a very creative guy and kind of off yeah. the wall thinker and director. I think there were, I, I think for me, there were some set pieces that still had his hallmarks. Yeah. Um, but in between those set pieces, it just, it felt like a work for hire. Like it could have been anybody. It didn't, didn't feel yeah. like Raimi through and through. And if yeah, you were exactly. wanting that, yep. like it sounds like you did, then I could see where it left you disappointed for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, over to your number four, mate. Number four is a movie we talked about way earlier in the year, almost a year ago. Of course, I'm talking about Firestarter. <laughs> it's uh, also on my list, but a little higher. Yep. <laughs> um, well, one, I would say go back and listen to that episode if you haven't uh, of We Watch a Thing because we already covered it. Um, yeah. This was a movie that you're actively forgetting it as you're watching it. Yeah. Like it, it, it leaves so little permanence in the mind that it is leaving your brain as quickly as it's coming in, as quickly as it's coming in your ears and eyes, it's going out the back of your head. And the parts that linger with you are the parts that are, um, I, on a script level, there's so many elements that are absolutely ill-conceived yeah. that, that end up being stakeless. Um, it ends up being like this sort of quasi superhero style yeah. movie at the very end, which is like completely wrong headed to everything that we've been presented to so far. The special effects and performances are absolutely laughable. Oh, um, so bad. This is one of the worst child performances of the year. <laughs> um, and she's not even the worst part about the movie. Every adult around her is like the lady who runs the lab, who works for the government or whatever is yep. maybe actively one of the worst actors uh, or oh, yes. actresses I've <laughs> seen. I, I've, I've never seen them before, <laughs> and I hope to never see them again. And <laughs> this was awful. This is an yeah. awful, awful film, and it's a terrible adaptation. Well, yeah, I think that's the other problem, and that's certainly why it made my list. And you and I spoke about this at length. You and I are obviously both big Stephen King fans. You know, yep. like the, the the first time we recorded together was over on your show doing the you know, the binge of, of King adaptations. Yeah. And so I, 
I know that I shouldn't have had high hopes, and obviously a lot of King adaptations like we spoke about aren't good, but I'm the, I even liked the Chloe Grace Moretz Carrie remake. So I thought that we were at least in for something like that. You know, even if not yep. a great movie, I thought we were in for something at least of that kind of level. At least pass. Oh, yeah. Fuck me. This was absolutely terrible. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This is one of those movies that is on par with, and it did get a, a brief theatrical run here in the United States. Um, and it landed very quickly on Peacock, uh, the streaming service. This is one of those movies that feels more akin to the direct to television movies of the nineties. Yeah, yeah. And it's and truth be told, it's not even as good as some of those. It's not as oh, good yeah. as the stand. You oh, know, no, it, the stand the is a brilliant miniseries. It, yeah. Yeah. So you're just like, whoa, why was this ever released? Why was this <laughs> ever put out? Yeah, like this is one of those ones. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not in favor of like shelving movies. Like I think they should just be released unless Same. there's a yeah. specific reason. You know, like the person starring it committed an atrocity. But again, again, if you're Warner Brothers, even that doesn't matter to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, this should have not been released. This was yeah. not ready. This was not a complete film. This was not done. Um. Everything about it is is real bad. So I'll just yeah. kick it back to you because I just going to come up again. <laughs> yeah. Well, my number four is, again, a movie which I, all I wanted from it was fun. I went in knowing that it wasn't going to be a good movie, but sometimes that's what you want. And unfortunately, it just didn't even hit the levels of fun I was hoping for. And I'm talking about Roland Emmerich's Moonfall. Yes! That's that's on my list. <laughs> Very <go>. close. <laughs> well, I I was just re- like I said, I'm not going in here expecting a brilliant movie, but I you know, I'm like, yeah, I've got my popcorn, I've got my ice cream and my coke. This is going to be a good time, and yeah. I just sat there kind of bored for 2 hours. And it sucks cuz I love this cast. Roland Emmerich when he's on fire can be really good, but it was just a dull dull time. <laughs> I don't know. You want me to go to spoilers and tell you that because this is just my number three. So this is my next <laughs> Well, entry. there you go. This is perfect because Firestarter is my number three. So I guess we just sail right past number three then. But yeah. yeah. Um, so Moonfall, at one point, a, a, a Chinese pop star has been cast into the movie because the majority of the funding for the movie came from China. Yeah. A, a Chinese Canadian pop star, I should say. Um. They're they're trying to outrun the moon, which which the moon is changing proximity to the earth and size, not just from scene to scene, Billy, but from shot to shot. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, it's really there is bad. absolutely no consistency, even within yeah. the complete comic book logic of this movie. This yes. is complete Roland Emmerich logic, so you you know that going in, so you have to accept it to a certain degree. Yeah. Like, okay, this is not, the rules of physics are not going to apply here whatsoever. And um, I accept that. It doesn't even follow its own rules if it even has any. Like, they'll be running and it'll be like the moon itself (laughs) almost has arms and legs and is running after them and is taking up all of the screen and then cut back to them and the moon (laughs) is almost normal size. And then at one point... You know, there's these gravity waves, these fluctuations in gravity, where yes. they, yeah. which somehow never have manages to crush their body, even though the moon is pretty much in the earth or on top of the earth at some point. Yep. Um, but these fluctuations are happening, and the girl at one point says, "It's it's the moon. It's helping us, or something. <laughs> like, it's gravity, gravity's helping us, and it l- allows her to lift a log off of this yeah. random fucking kid that we're following, who we give no shits about." Also, here's another one where, despite it being one of the most expensive independent films, independently yes. financed films ever made, this yep. thing looks like shit. This yeah, thing it looks does. Yes, yeah. terrible. And yep. the, the 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 whole weird fucking subplot of Sam from Game of Thrones being sucked oh up into an God. alien hollow moon <laughs> holograph computer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then the, at, at a certain point he's popping pills out of a container and and it's and the joke is that some of them are for ir- irritable bowel syndrome but then there's no real payoff like yeah we, we're, we, we have a we have an insert shot where we focus on the <laughs> multicolored pills and you think it's gonna come into play for something and it never does yep. none of the jokes land uh, oh no Patrick Wilson trying to outrun. CGI waves in the streets and then in the lobby of that hotel. 
and somehow he manages not to get washed away. Every shot of him uh, uh, where he's crudely keyed into a green screen, yeah, just Patrick yeah. Wilson in front of very clearly <laughs> like, a, a, like a PlayStation 3 cutscene. Yeah. And he's just yeah. Patrick Wilson just standing there. I mean, it, it's for Roland Emmerich to produce something like this, I know. it's shocking yeah. because this was pure amateur hour stuff. Yeah, and it bothers me so much because I've spoken about this at length. I adore Patrick Wilson. I love him. I think he's the most heads of men alive. Wow. <laughs> and What's was- going on with his career, though? <laughs> he makes some choices, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. You brought up the visual effects. The thing that annoys me about this is that there's no reason for them to look like that. Like, no. Not- not to bring it up again, this is the worst of list, not the best of, but everything, everywhere, all at once had a crew of five visual effects artists. Like That's what's five. insane. And it looks like, you know, sure, it still has its flaws, but this is a big budget Roland Emmerich movie. I know it's still yeah. independently financed, but that doesn't mean that it was a cheap movie, but it looks like it. No, it it, it it very well, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it has probably at minimum 100, 100 times the budget oh, yeah. of yeah. other smaller movies we've seen this year, and it still manages to look like shit. It just yeah. looks awful. I would I would go so far as to say that I think this is the single worst looking movie Roland Emmerich has ever made. Yeah, yeah. And, and the that thing includes that ones me- that are 35 years old. Yeah. And the thing that bothers me the most about it is that I actually quite like the story. Like, the concept for this film is actually really strong. And in the right hands, this could have been a really good blockbuster that, if nothing else, was at least fun. And unfortunately, yes. it's just not even that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm all for, like, hey, this is a stupid fun time at the theater or stupid fun time at the movie. So, let's laugh at this movie. And to a certain extent, when it's Roland Emmerich, you're, that's kind of what you're signing up for. Yeah. Um, th- this to me wasn't stupid fun. It was really grating and kind of obnoxious. Yeah. Well, there you go. I guess we sail right past that number three because yours is Moonfall, mine is Firestarter. So hit us with your number two. Can't believe okay. we're at the pointy end already. <laughs> I know. Well, I got, like I said, we got some honorable mentions. So <laughs> yeah. number two, I'm just, is a smaller movie, as is my number one. And I, I, if if there was, if I was ever reticent of putting two small like movies at the top of the list as being worse of it's smaller films, it's more independent films, it's genre yep. films, because they don't they don't typically have as much money or time to be able to execute their ideas, right? But these movies were so bad that I had to <laughs> forego my sympathy and my empathy for the people who made them. Yeah. Coming at number two for me is Scare Package 2, Rad Chad's Revenge. Have you seen the original <laughs> Scare Package? I don't believe I've ever heard of Scare Package. <laughs> okay, Scare Package is an independent American, I think American, uh, horror anthology that- uh, Oh, takes I like place, anthologies. Takes place within a video store, Rad Chad's Horror Emporium. I mean, well, that uh, sounds awesome straight up. <laughs> and it is a comedic, kind of meta, self-aware- horror movie, the thing that makes the first uh, scare package work is that they take the horror serious and then they find the jokes within the context of the genre. Yeah. So it's not like a scary movie or something like that. That it's, it's, it's not so much a spoof as much as it is a satire of each anthology story is a horror story first and foremost. And yep. they all represent different kind of tropes within the horror genre including the wraparound for the movie. The movie it's a movie with a wraparound with a wraparound, ironically. <laughs> uh, that actually because- sounds awesome. So would you recommend this first one? The first one I would recommend, and the first, the second one is so bad, my esteem for the first one went up. So I went back and retroactively added a star <laughs> to the first movie because I was like, well, Jesus, because it's the exact same crew of people. Yeah, they, right. They, one of the most incoherent, unintelligible oh. movies. The, the 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 first movie was each anthology story is is a is a different tape or DVD that yep. is in the store and it's a video store owner training one of his new employees uh, of uh you know about horror movies or whatever and they're talking about it and then they go into the movie and we see what the movie is and then it links back up to what's happening within the store yeah, and then right. eventually I don't want to spoil it but I will just say for those that know who he is Joe Bob Briggs makes a cameo towards the end of the movie. Okay. So it's very interesting. It's creative. It's fun. It's, it's uh, obviously dumped a lot of love. The exact same crew of people come back and they decide to do another movie that is supposed to take place. It opens at a funeral 
and it is ostensibly ends up becoming a Saw parody, which yeah. if we are doing a parody, because again, the first one is not a parody, it's a satire. Yeah. Parody and satire aren't the same thing. If we're doing a spoof of Saw, which is a series of films that is almost two decades old at this point. Yeah. It, yeah. it The sell by date has come and gone, Billy, for this concept. <laughs> Yeah, and it, where, what it effectively is is even within its anthology parts and all the wraparound parts, it's the latter scary movies. This could have just yeah. been Scary Movie Seven. Yeah, it's as if they made Scary Movie Seven or Eight or Nine or whatever. The just fuck, rebadged it <laughs> fifteen years ago, never released it, and then put it out and said, "This is Scare Package 2. Except yeah. for the fact that it's the same cast. It is so poorly done that in every single scene, the rules they sh- they they set up they immediately disregard to the point that it makes the entire spoof or parody that they're doing in that scene completely pointless. And there's a middle portion of the movie that I thought I got an advanced copy from uh, the producers. I thought maybe I got an unfinished copy. The movie in its final form is so poorly finished, so poorly executed, so poorly edited that I thought I, I got a assembly cut of the movie and it hadn't been finalized. Because at a certain point, the film becomes, ap- I'm, I'm not exaggerating, absolutely incoherent from an editing yeah. perspective. Wow. Scene, scene cut to cut is illegible. It, it, is, it is one of the worst finalized films I have ever seen. Wow. I mean, <laughs> you haven't sold it, but you have got me very excited for the first one, actually. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> let, let me put a final stamp on it for you, Billy. The movie is so incoherent, it, even as the movie's unfolding, from shot to shot, they have two different people playing the villain. You're kidding. <laughs> and they're t- not just two different people playing the same character, two different characters who are explained as the villain. So imagine I'm giving my villain monologue, but then when it cuts to the reverse, it's somebody else playing a different character. Wow. It's almost as if... Is that been- purposeful? I have no fucking <laughs> clue. I mean, There's no joke about it. It's just it's almost as if they did reshoots because they realize, well, this character isn't working or it doesn't make sense for that guy to be the villain. So we're going to have yeah. this other person be the villain. And then they the edits just got I, – I seriously, I was going to reach out to the distributor and go, <laughs> did you send me the wrong version of this? That is insane. Like, it just, it's, not, it's, not, it's an almost unwatchable film because of it. It's absolutely bizarre. Yeah. Well, my number two is also a sequel, um, but it's a much, much bigger budget one. And it was almost my most disappointed of the year because I am such a big fan of most of the films in this franchise. It's Jurassic World Dominion, which yep. again, speaking of incoherent, <laughs> like, oh, I mean, yes. come on. It's it's the final yeah. kind of, of this saga. It's Jurassic World. There's supposedly dinosaurs everywhere. And instead yep. of focusing on any of that, the story involves locusts. And like just new characters that have nothing to do with anything. You get all these old characters back and then just do virtually nothing with them. They're just there just for the credit of being on screen. It was just so, so disappointing to me. And I ended up having to see this movie twice because I went to it once for the podcast. And then my daughter, who's just turned eight, she got big into Jurassic Park as well and wanted to go see it. So I took her for her birthday and... Even she, an eight-year-old child who had just seen the first Jurassic Park, was like, this is a bad movie. And I was like, yes, you are right. It is. <laughs> I showed it to somebody who is a big Jurassic Park fan as well. And they, as they were watching it, they they actually said these words, Billy. They said, I reject this movie. This isn't happening. I reject this. This doesn't exist. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't made. <laughs> I reject this, and it was yeah. it was like the line where the uh, where I, I I reject your reality and I I substitute it with another. It's pretty much what they were saying. <laughs> yeah. they, they were so offended at how how bad the movie was that they yeah. couldn't believe that it was real. And I I couldn't yeah. believe it was. Real. I mean, you get Sam Neill to play oh. Alan Grant again, and he, they didn't even write dialogue for him. He doesn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely horrifying what happened and the thing i even liked the first jurassic world like i had a lot of fun with that one fallen kingdom was 
bad, but I was like, okay, surely this third one is going to redeem it. Like they've got Sam Neill and Laura Dern and Jeff Goldblum back. And, you know, it's all going to culminate both of these franchises coming together. And it was just a bad movie. So disappointing. (laughs) I think what we can truly say is all of these legacy sequel trilogies that have come out, um, none of them on the whole have been successful. There have been maybe yeah. parts of movies or we can disagree about, well, I like this movie in the, in the new trilogy, but I don't like this one or I like this way of doing it or I like this scene or I like that character. But on the whole, none of them have been coherent oh, yeah. trilogies. Yeah. None of them have been coherent stories. They've set stuff up. They haven't executed. It, honestly, it, it, the, the amount of money that they spend on these movies and the fact that they are they barely have anything to do with a movie that preceded it is yeah. stunning. Yeah. Stunning to me. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. And you're, and there's been quite a few lately, of course, because we've had this. We've had the new Halloween trilogy. Yep, yep. Um, the Star Wars ones. The Star yeah. Wars, and it's they like, all have the same problems. And you're like, what is going on? Yeah, and particularly, I I can't remember with the new Halloween one whether they knew that was going to be a trilogy from the start or not. But I don't at think. Least, I, I, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, but I believe that this and obviously Star Wars, they both knew were a three picture series, and to have not done any planning. I don't understand how that happens. How does a big studio either. film like this not from the start plan out the entire series? It doesn't make any sense to me. No, and they're investing at, at times a uh, half a billion dollars in each of these movies. Yeah. what? Well, who is running a ship at these studios where you're going to invest half a billion dollars, countless months, countless resources, countless time, uh, and just not have a plan? That just seems yeah. asinine to me. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, here we go. What's what's your number one? You said that this was another <laughs> smaller film. Oh, Billy. <clears throat> this is the Alex Phillips transgressive comedy about a person who's consuming hallucinogenic worms. Right. Uh, I'm talking about all jacked up and full of worms. <laughs> what? That's the title of the movie. <laughs> That's the title of the movie. <laughs> This got all kind of fanfare out of um, Beyond Fest or this, that, whatever. One of the, a a smaller independent genre film festival and everybody was raving about it. This is, this is like a Cronenberg movie for the, you know, Cronenberg meets John Waters, you know, and it's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. It's so hilarious and spooky and scary and strange and inventive and creative. Um, I'll just say this. uh, At one point in the movie, a character who a grown man uh, who looks like he came out of his mother's basement. Yeah. Um, looks like he should have a podcast talking about movies. Quite <laughs> honestly. Um, real greasy. He's obsessed uh, with having a baby. He wants to have a child. He wants to be a father and he orders a baby in the mail, like a doll. One of those like, you know, okay. Life-like so not a real dolls. baby. Okay. Yeah. Not a real baby. But when he gets it, what he realizes is that the doll is actually for sex offenders. It's for pedophiles. Uh, And its mouth and body parts are meant for uh, adult-sized genitalia. Yeah. And then from there, we realize that he only really wanted a baby so that he could do things to it. And then the movie routinely goes back to him in the woods with this child. And he's maybe the closest thing to a protagonist in the film and right. everybody else in the movie is as fucked up as or worse than him every single character has some sort of trait like that yeah. and they are all they spend the movie snorting worms having hallucinogenic experiences right at which point people's guts come alive and rip other people apart and it just seems to be a series of things to shock the audience yeah. And yeah. and and really nothing else to say. And it's like how transgressive can we be? And I'm I'm all for transgressive art. I'm not a uh, Puritan in any sort of way. I, I've yeah. seen my fair share of disturbing things. I go so far, and this is why this lands at my number one. I would go so far as to think say that I think this movie is absolutely morally reprehensible. Yeah. It is right. a morally repugnant film and is poorly made. And is not as clever or as funny as it thinks that it is. Yeah. And so you were saying that this was quite lauded at one of the small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Among among film critics. Again. Again. <laughs> the same people that tell you, <laughs> you can't make a worst of list. Those same people are in such an insular industry bubble. Yeah. 
yep. that they anything that is different, they tend to lift up and go, "Oh my god!" Because they watch yeah. a thousand movies a year. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of genre fans, a lot of horror fans, again, a lot of Cronenberg fans. And this isn't on the level of anything Cronenberg or his son has ever done. And they've had some disturbing shit in their movies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cronenberg's the guy who made a movie about a woman whose armpit wants to eat other people's dicks. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. like, <laughs> like he yeah. makes some weird shit. Uh, yeah. He made weird shit this year uh, with Which Crimes of the Future or whatever. We may chat about in a second. <laughs> <laughs> And John Waters, you know, right? John Waters with Divine made some weird shit. I mean, literally, uh, Divine ends up eating dog shit in the movie. (laughs) That has more artistic merit and something to say and a point behind it. uh, Because there's there's at least John Waters to a degree, even even when he casts real freaks, he had empathy for the people he's putting on the screen. Even if it's in a twisted John Waters sort of way, that was never at their expense. These are people pretending... They're acting, they're pretending to be freaks, and the movie has no empathy for its characters. It's yeah. as mean-spirited and ugly as it can be, and it, it just wants to be mean-spirited and ugly for the sake of being mean-spirited and ugly, and for that, it has no value. Yeah. I, I'm like There are some films that do have some kind of disgusting, reprehensible content, Sure, but if, yes. it, if it serves an artistic purpose, like you said, yeah. that's or a, a narrative purpose. Thing. Or a well, narrative yeah. purpose. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. This, that this, sounds absolutely this, terrible. It's absolutely terrible, and there's probably maybe some uh, listeners to your show, which is quite popular, who have seen this film or uh, or ex- are excited to watch it because it did. It have had some buzz amongst, uh, in particular, like independent fans and genre fans. Yeah, um, I, I think it's absolutely um, uh, Fantasia Fest and and Beyond Fest. I think is where it debuted. I just yeah. think it's despicable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, on to my number one, which I guess I've kind of mentioned as you, you brought it up. You were just talking about Cronenberg quite heavily. And I know that you, like many other people, have a bit of a, a love-hate relationship with Cronenberg. You, yes. you did a binge of some of his movies earlier <laughs> yeah. this year, which was a fantastic episode. And um, a lot of them I, I hadn't actually seen. But what I have seen of Cronenberg, much like you, some of it's fantastic, some of it's not. I was actually really looking forward to Crimes of the Future this year, and I don't know why, because it is with a bullet. The second I saw it, I was like, that's the worst movie I've seen. This year. <laughs> and it's it's not it's not the content. It's just yeah. a badly made film. Like, 90% yeah. of the dialogue is exposition. Like, do some world building. You've got this kind of sci-fi fantasy future world and instead of just letting us discover it you have things like a character saying to another oh but remember you know like we do this and like, it's like no no that's yeah. just bad filmmaking and i just found it deeply uninteresting it wants to be shocking but it's actually not ever not at one point in this movie was i kind of you know and I, sometimes particularly scalpels make me queasy i have no problem with someone getting stabbed but someone yeah. getting scalpeled i'm like oh i don't like that Slice, but in this movie slicing just, somebody yeah yeah, yeah. Right. but in this movie i just felt nothing it's just a really poorly made film <laughs> did you see this one um no, I started it and I never finished it because I was like, this yeah. is just... Unfortunately, with Cronenberg, the latter part of his career, and really like the first part of his career, but, the, but <laughs> he, he, needs a, he needs a co-writer. He needs a screenwriter. Yeah, yeah. He needs to be like... He's so imaginative and disturbed and, and, a, and a pervert, which is why I had Paul on uh, from the <laughs> countdown because he's a pervert as well. But I, <laughs> he's not actually. But, um <laughs> Uh, but it's like he needs he needs somebody to go. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, a, we like a vaginal port where you plug into your computer through a <laughs> vagina in your brain or you know a vagina in your spine or something. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, like sex and technology and surgeries and yeah, uh, you yeah. know having ear implants on your back. Like that's really that could be something. But what if we also had a story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then when he when he's when he's done movies like that, then he's an, an inc- incredible filmmaker. And then, yeah. But the older he's gotten, like a lot of older auteurs, he just has like thrown the shackles off, and he just wants to, you know, scrounge up mon- money over a decade or so and shoot the thing he wants to shoot. And the thing is, like, he's has, he's such an austere filmmaker 
that when you don't have somebody else in there to add humanity to his movies, it's just, they're almost all just conceptual. Like you said, yeah, he has no use really for actual dialogue. He does. I don't think he knows how real people talk because I don't think he's a real person. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're he right, just wants his the, ideas of like surgery is sex, surgery is the new sex. That's my movie, and it's yeah. like, uh, okay, all right. Yeah, and the thing is, like conceptually, there are some interesting things yeah. in the film. Like even just like on the kind of world side, all of their weird furniture, which is shaped like the body because it supposedly is. You know, it's more ergonomical for your body and stuff. Like, that's not a bad idea, but he doesn't do anything with it. And every piece of dialogue about it is just so exposition-y, just explaining what his idea is, that it's like, it becomes completely uninteresting. And it's a real shame because, yeah, there's some interesting things about the movie, but it's just so poorly executed from start to finish. You're right. Somebody else needs to, like, just get what's out of his brain and yeah. then write an actual story with proper dialogue <laughs> yeah. around it. <laughs> yeah, he's almost more of like a philosopher, like a weird philosopher yeah. in a way. And yeah. and he just so happens to make movies. And the yeah. older he's gotten, the more he cares about the philosophy or the ideas or what the the the, the best quote that I that from him which is insane and just let you know how really whacked he is. And I say that with love and respect, but he's whacked. <laughs> he says, "Oh, I really just I make movies based on the things we all think about." Oh uh, yes, now, yeah, Billy. I've never <laughs> thought about what if furniture was shaped and made out of human body parts because it's more yeah. ergonomic for our body. Like I've never, I've, I've, I can promise you, in my yeah. deepest, darkest, most perverted, defiled thoughts, yeah, I've never thought anything that has crossed through the mind of David Cronenberg. Never. Yeah. Never. I've never, Nobody I've never had. once thought about performing surgery on someone just for the fun of it, seeing for if pleasure. I can add an ear on their back just because it's sexy. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. call me a freak, but I'm yeah. sorry, that's just not me. <laughs> no. I, yeah. yeah. And the thing is, like, I, 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 there are serial killers who've never thought the things that Cronenberg has thought. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> I, I was like, no, Dave, you you are truly alone <laughs> in this world. Uh, that's great. Well, I mean, that's it. That's our that's our five. Hit me up with your um your honorable mentions. Okay, so honorable mentions. Coming in at number, I guess would be ten for me, is Halloween ends. Yeah. Um very th- bad. I, I, oh my god. I see the thing is I was not a fan of Halloween kills either. Yeah. I was, uh, for the most part, a fan of the 2018. There were things about it I was like, oh, that feels off kilter. But I accepted it on the whole again. Um, yeah. Halloween Kills, it was like shocking how schlocky they ended up making that yeah. and incoherent. And I think what's the point is, I think it's very, very clear. They didn't have a trilogy in mind. It just so happens the first yeah. movie made a shit ton of money. Blumhouse backed up yep. the, the truck and David Gordon Green decided he was, you know, they just kind of fucked around and came up with whatever they could. Yeah. Um, I don't need, I'm not even as a, a, opposed to the, the Corey plot, but the thing that you can also tell is this movie had w- underwent massive reshoots. You can tell it was one thing and it, it, it was conceived as one thing. It was shot as another thing and it was edited as a, another thing. Yeah. And that makes the movie in the end kind of incoherent. It's serving multiple masters and pleasing none. Yeah. Uh, so Halloween ends. I, I I was like, you could have just made a complete independent movie about this Corey character that has nothing to do with Haddonfield or anything, because yeah. some of the concepts there are about sort of the transmittability of trauma and, and and how that spreads like infection and how when it's untreated it could lead to uh, evil. That's very interesting, but I just don't think it fits with a Michael Myers film or a Halloween. Film. Yeah. And yep. Jamie Lee Curtis was completely turfed in the entire movie. So yeah. again, for the for the for the second time in this trilogy. So it's a it, it's an ignoble end to this <laughs> horrible franchise, which you know they're going to do another one. It'll yeah. be a and reboot disapp- of some kind. Again, the disappointing thing is I liked the first one in this trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was actually good fun. I liked Judy Greer. I thought that was actually really well executed. But yeah. man, these second two have been bad. <laughs> yep, the second and third one are. are yeah, I'm with you. They're I don't want to call them disasters, but they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, coming. Uh, I guess my number nine then would be "Marry Me," which is Jennifer uh, Lopez and Owen Wilson. Um, I'm a rom com guy, Billy. I don't know if you like rom coms or like some of them. Do you like some rom coms? I, I I do enjoy a rom com. Yeah, 
And so I like the idea of, hey, this is like an early, this is a revival of almost like an early 2000s movie that Owen Wilson and J-Lo yeah. would have done. And that's neat. It's a throwback. The acting is piss poor. It looks like shit. <laughs> and even for a rom-com, because they don't typically, they're not typically well-made movies. Um, the entire conceit from the very beginning, I just can't get on board with it. This woman just picks a random guy out of the audience is like, I'll marry you. And for no reason whatsoever, he's just like, okay. <laughs> and and th then, okay, if, if you want me to get on board with this really kind of ludicrous premise, then you got to do something really fun and interesting with it. And the movie doesn't. Yeah. It actually yeah. wasted stars. It wait, you know, if if you want me to believe they're ridiculous, do something fun with it. And this movie yeah. didn't, so it just yeah. fell flat. Uh, the next one for me is Uncharted. Oh which... no, I actually liked Uncharted. I mean, it's not making my best of list, oh. but I think I gave that around a six. I, I didn't. He, let me ask you this though: yeah. Are you a gamer? Were you a player of the games or something? Not a player of the games, but I went oh. with people who played the games because they made me go with them. Two buddies, right? Did and they like it better? I've never played. The no, games, they so liked I'd... it less than I did. <laughs> yeah, well, that, okay, that's what I thought because I've never played the games, and I figured maybe that's why I thought it was okay. I had fun with this. At one point, the guy who demanded I go to it turned to me and goes, "This is awful. Awful." <laughs> and we were only ten minutes in. We were only ten minutes in the movie. They fight for an ancient artifact in Rome. Yeah. Where do you think they fight? Where do you think the fight takes place, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> in a Papa John's pizza. <laughs> in Rome. They are in Rome. And this hidden artifact that yeah. has got the whatever that unlocks the door to the secret <laughs> thing to do the whatever is behind glass at a Papa John's pizza. Makes and, complete and sense. Be <laughs> behind the secret passage that's that's in the in the dining room of a Papa John's pizza, there's also a nightclub where secret underground raves go on. <laughs> and the people at Papa John's are none the wiser, even though there's only a, a four foot wall separating them. A, 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 a two thousand year old four foot wall. I mean, yeah, it's not it's not a good movie, but this is for me. This was what I got out of what I was hoping for from Moonfall. I just had a decent enough time. It was it was fine. <laughs> when they start airlifting four hundred year old pirate ships, yes, yeah, I was like, oh man, this this whole thing just <laughs> it stunk from start to end. It just didn't make any sense. She she pickpockets his uh, 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 knapsack or his book bag. And she's four feet away from him, and, it is, and at no point whatsoever could she ever have stolen it from him. We yeah. they they just jump from continent to continent and act. The, we they intercut and jump in mid action scene into like where are we? What's happening? What the fuck is this? <laughs> and, and, oh my gosh! I thought it was abysmal. <laughs> Jurassic World is on my list as well. We've already yep. covered that. And the final one for me is I couldn't get behind the memes. I couldn't get. I didn't think it was funny. The person next to me was having the time of their life just laughing at it the entire time. Of course, I'm talking about Morbius. It's Morbin time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this this is abysmal. Morbius, I gave a, a one star to. <sighs> but, um, but for me, it's like, I don't know. That movie is just so bad. Do you even need to mention it? It's so bad. Well, that's why, that's why I landed in my honorable mentions. Yeah. 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 I was just like, we all know it's shit. Even, even the people that are like, yeah. It, and they're like, yeah, it's Morbin time. Never in the history of film has a movie been meme for how shit it was. The studio of elderly people misinterpreted the memes, put it back oh, no. out in theaters, and were like, yeah. released it. <laughs> we released it within a, within six weeks of it flopping, and it flopped yeah. again. It's a yeah. double flop. It's a double flop in the same year. That's never happened. Yep. Absolutely terrible. Yeah. The only other movies that, that I would mention are, because uh, i got kids, I have to watch a lot of kids' movies. And a yep. lot of the kids' movies this year were terrible. Hocus Pocus 2 was a massive disappointment. Uh, um, I, I have never been a fan of Minions, but The Rise of Gru was just like ADHD thrown on a screen. It's just- I've colors heard, and yeah. oh it's it really fucks with your mind it's like a cronenberg <laughs> movie for kids um, <laughs> put that on the blu-ray the rise of Gru really fucks with your mind B Dizzle, we watched the thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a Cronenberg trick. <laughs> it, it honestly is. Uh, so they're the only other kind of movies I would mention. But yeah, <laughs> not good. 
Well, this this has been fun. This has just been. Fun. I love chatting movies with you. We'll have to do this oh, again thanks, sometime soon. Um, can you tell everybody about binge movies? Oh, what is there to say? You know, in the universe that we live in, stars come, <laughs> stars go. I don't mean movie stars. I mean actual constellations. <laughs> and stars die, and in the wake of their death, energy is dispersed. Parts of the universe grow colder. <laughs> And the video store is like that. The video store is like a dying star. It's a dying <laughs> ember of a dying galaxy. And I just so happen to work at one. And I have many misadventures uh, that you know deal with uh, pseudoscience, quantum physics, monsters, hell mouths, <laughs> demons from hell, elder gods, old ones, and uh, late fees. And in the midst of that, I somehow have to... Binge an entire list of movies selected by the Dark Movie Overlords. Uh, I binge it throughout the course of a year. Break those movies down into themes. Those themes become episodes. Generous guests like Billy dedicate hour upon hour and upon hour of their life to watch those movies, to analyze those movies, to critique those films, to assess them, to review them, to rank them. And then he's got his list. I've got mine. He says, this is the best. I say, no, that's the best. <laughs> and we do that over and over and over again. And at the end of uh, the season, uh, we, we kind of have these little micro seasons. We have four little mini seasons throughout the year that make up our year. And at the end of each season, uh, the, the best movies as determined by our guest and the best movies as determined by me face off and two film critics compete in a little thing called Last Movie Standing. And then the listeners, uh, they get to vote, and the best of the best of the best goes into the no copyright infringement intended vault to be preserved for all time, even beyond yeah. the end times. <laughs> it um, really the is. The end times, an they're awesome coming, show. folks. The end of the universe <laughs> is drawing near, and the old ones are going to return, and the darkness will consume the light, and they're going to need something to watch when we're all gone. So <laughs> we're stocking the shelves for the great uh, home video, uh, 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 home video center. For the elder gods of the, of the future, so yeah, it really is an awesome show, and you are an incredible host. Like there are some shows oh, that thanks, I listen man. to where, depending on who the guest is, I might skip it that week. But the thing is that you have such a good rapport, and you're so easy to chat to that every episode is just great. It doesn't matter who the guest is; it's always awesome. It doesn't matter what the topic is. There will be some topics where I'll be like, oh, "I'm not that interested in that," you know, that topic, but. It's still going to be good. <laughs> oh, and, wow. and it always you, is. I've, I've been very lucky that when I was on previously, pretty much all the movies we watched were good and yeah, pretty no decent. spoilers, but mm. we've we've lined up something for next year, which again are movies that I'm actively looking forward to binging. But yeah. geez, some of the topics, I, 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 I feel bad for Paul every Halloween like this year <laughs> where you made him watch- why? All of now, listen, I get this all the time. You're a kind soul. I get this all the time. I, I people, I mean, truly, people around the world for seven years now yep. have told me I feel bad for Paul. I feel bad for Paul. <laughs> Paul is is a very successful professional. He's got a very beautiful life. Uh, he's got yep. a beautiful wife, a beautiful <laughs> child. He's got a beautiful lifelong friendship with uh, Wayne, who has an amazing laugh uh, and has stories. Of his sexual escapades that entertain <laughs> thousands of people around the world. He's, he's eating they, all the asses. <laughs> he's the star of one of the most popular podcasts on the planet. And the top, they, you know, the countdown is in the top 1% of all podcasts in the world. I do. And they know come that, from yeah. this little shithole called Perth, Australia. <laughs> nothing, nothing against Perth. I come from a shithole called Akron, Ohio. So we all come from a shithole. But. And then I don't feel pity for Paul. Paul, Paul, right now as we record this, is somewhere on a beautiful tropical vacation, and all he has to do is sit and watch horror movies. Which, by the way, he's seen all this shit before. <laughs> that, that's he, true. He has and he seen watches all it in his them. free time. Yeah, he watches <laughs> these movies in his free time. He lo he loves to garner sympathy from people. It's it's uh, don't feel. But bad it is for it is a fantastic show. I'd recommend it to. Everybody, as, as mentioned, I'm a card carrying binge lord now. I give yeah, you my hard earned so money much. every week. No, because it's just a fantastic show. It's just a great listen. So everybody out there, if you haven't listened to it yet, go check it out. And I'll definitely have you back on sometime in the new year oh, as well. I would so. love that. Yeah. But thank but you for joining me. This has been awesome. Slagging yeah. off bad films, <laughs> not not tacky at all. <laughs> no, not tacky at all. I, mean, I may have been tacky, but uh, but the 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 doing this with you has been tacky. It's always an honor to come on here because. Uh, you're also in that top 1%, my friend. Uh, and 
you're not you're not a guy you're not a braggadocious sort of person but i can brag on you and i know your listeners <laughs> brag on you billy billy is a great guy he's a great guy behind the scenes he's a very kind soul and um he's got a great podcast here as i'm preaching to the converted <laughs> and uh he's got one of the most popular movie podcasts in the world for a reason so it's always an honor to be here oh thank you very much mate well, we'll definitely line up something soon but that's it. That's it for us. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do that at wewatchedathing.com or wewatchedathing at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchedathing. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchedathing, and I'll catch you next week. Oh.